the lost of Jesus and forth the gospel sound. Unfurl the royal banner, go shout the news aloud. Ring out, ring out, ring out, ring out. We're continuing uh, to discuss angels. We just began last week uh, with this topic. It was suggested uh, by uh, one of our members, and it was a great idea. Certainly a series uh, that will be uh, very interesting, hopefully, as it's certainly a topic uh, that uh, we need to study, that we need to know about. It's something that is often kind of avoided. I think maybe because there is some obscurity, maybe because we can't answer all the questions, uh, but it is a, a topic that is discussed very often, very prevalent throughout the Scriptures. We mentioned last week nearly 300 times the word angel or some form of it is used between the Old and, and New Testaments. And basically, just by way of quick review, we discussed last week that these angels are important because they're involved with our salvation. They're involved with God's gospel plan of salvation. They were involved with Christ proclaiming His birth, proclaiming His resurrection. And as I learn more about my Savior, I want to know everything I can about Him, then I want to know about these angels because they were part of His life and they are part of His ministry even today. They protected Him. When you think about Herod and the decree that was set out to have these baby boys killed, and it was the angel that warned them, get out of here, get out of Dodge, as it were, and, and uh, he also told them to come back later when it was safe. They provided for him after the temptations, the devil uh, tempting him in three ways, the three categories of sin. Always he was tempted, and, and they ministered to him when he was without food. He needed something to eat, something to drink, and encouragement, and they gave that to him. And, of course, they appreciated him. And, and we talked about what we meant by that. But you know, they, they, they revered him. They feared him. They were there with, at his ascension going back to heaven and, and so much more. And so we concluded last week talking about the fact that they are created beings. As we continue now to discuss their origin. They are created beings. They're not eternal in the sense that they are deity. In the sense that they've always been. They had a beginning point. But like us and our spirit, as they are spirits... Uh, they are eternal beings. In uh, Nehemiah 9 and all of these passages that you're looking at, we learn a couple of things. One, as, we, as I just said, that they are spiritual beings. Uh, that, that means that we cannot see them in the flesh. Uh, we'll talk about some unique instances in the Old Testament where they could and why they could. We also pointed out that they have free will. Just like us, they had the opportunity to decide to follow God or not. And of course, Satan and his angels, as you recall, chose not to. And those angels that chose not to follow God are going to be and are even now in what location? They're in, in hell or at least the waiting place for it, right? Second Peter 2, 4. And in Tartarus, they're in that place being reserved in these chains of darkness. And as, as we mentioned last week, what a scary thought to know that, that not only will it be dark, not only will hell be a place of fire, it's going to be a place where your worst nightmares will come true. These demons, these angels that are evil, called demons will be there with us for eternity if that's the place we choose to go to. And then this is where we concluded and, and where we'll begin to slow down and, and pick up. And that is that angels do not have a Savior. I believe it was Carlos last week that made the point, and we can understand uh, logically why that would be in, in the fact that they're in heaven. They're with God. They're with Christ. And they have an opportunity that we've yet to have. While we were created by God and our soul maybe was made in heaven, you might could argue, but we were immediately placed in our physical body and we don't know heaven or know God or Christ in the intimate sense that these angels do. And so their opportunities are different. But if you look at Hebrews 2 and verse 16, if you have your Bibles, let's pick up with some passages. And I hope you have your Bibles and, and I'll have some volunteers maybe throughout the study tonight, if you will, to, to read for us. Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 16. Once you get there, if somebody would read that, please, out loud for us. Just verse 16. <laughs> Excellent. For what it's worth, I'd rather have three people trying to read than nobody reading. That's, that's much more efficient with our time. Verse 16, as he said there, Christ chose to take on the nature, not of angels, but the nature of who? of man. Christ is our Savior. Oh, that's just incredible. He, he chose us. And again, we've already kind of noted why, but well, He's our Savior. He died for us. The angels do not have a Savior. They don't have one that died for them. They don't have a means of 
uh, repentance. And again, understanding why, because of where they were and their opportunities that they had. But Christ came down for us. And it's so interesting, when you look at Ephesians 3.10, excuse me, yeah, Ephesians 3.10, we'll just mention it. But it talks about how the, the angels almost are, are learning about God and His plan of salvation by watching the church today. The manifold wisdom of God there, he says, it's manifest in the church to these uh, principalities and powers. That, of course, we studied last week included these angels. And so they've been watching from the very beginning of creation. They have watched God's plan of salvation unfold generation after generation from Old Testament to New Testament. And they're watching even now as we are obeying Christ, becoming His children. What an incredible thought that is. Now, when were they created? This is a question that we can't nail down. The Bible doesn't come out and say, this is the exact date, this is the exact time that they were created. However, we can get a good general idea of when they were created, at least what they were created prior to. Look at Job with me. Job chapter 38. Job 38, <clears throat> beginning in verse 4. I'll give you a moment to get there and then read along with me here. Job 38, beginning in verse 4. God speaking to Job, asking him, you remember, a series of questions, showing his greatness, showing his magnitude, his majesty. Here's what we read in Job 38, 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Now, what would God mean here when he says the foundations, laying the foundations of the earth? What's he referencing? What time period? The creation, the creation of the world. He says in verse 5, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? And of course, the, the rhetorical questions, the answer to all of these is who? The one and only God Almighty. Verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? What a question through the ages, the history of man trying to answer that one. What's it fastened on? How is it just hanging there? But then verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God shouted for joy when what was taking place? The creation of the world. At least the laying of the foundations. So before God laid the foundations of the world, angels had already been created. Now, here's what is so interesting to me. If you, uh, if you will, turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20. And we could, we could go to Genesis and read through the days of creation and, and kind of put some things together. We won't take the time to do that. Uh, but in Exodus 20, at least in verse 11, let's read this one. Maybe someone else again for me. Uh, there was a couple of folks that tried to read earlier. Maybe someone that uh, didn't get to, if you'll read that one for us. Exodus 20, verse 11. Excellent. According to Exodus 20 and verse 11, what did God not create during the six days? Kind of a, kind of a trick question there. Look at it again. According to, he, he says, I created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. There's nothing He did not create in those six days. If I'm understanding my Bible correctly, that is all-inclusive. Right? Heaven, and even if you want to say heaven is the, the firmament, there's still this... Uh, you go back to Genesis 1 and read on day 1 what occurred and, and you see God creating light. You see Him creating uh, the, uh, the land on day 3. That's when the physical land appeared. You see the water before then. Here's what I'm getting at. It seems we can at least know for a fact that the angels were created before God laid the foundations. You could argue that was on day 3 maybe. It is very possible because there's no evidence, there's no reason to think that God ever created anything prior to day one. It's just not there, biblically speaking. And so it seems maybe logical to conclude, not that it really is that important, but just something to think about, that maybe these angels were one of the first things on day one that God created. It doesn't tell us when He created the angels. We don't know. But maybe it was there on day one, and then they watched as the rest of creation was made. Further evidence of that, logically speaking, think about who immediately came down who was, uh, based on how you want to take what, how it's worded in Revelation, who was quote-unquote kicked out of heaven, who came down and tempted mankind. That was Satan. 
And prior to him leaving heaven and doing that, you remember John 8, 44, he was the what of lies and really of sin in general. He's the father of it. He was the first to do it. Do you think Satan lived for thousands and thousands of years faithful to God in heaven? Does your Bible give any indication that there was ever a moment in which Satan chose God? He is the father of evil. He, as soon as God created him and he had the opportunity to choose for himself, he immediately chose sin. And what did he do is he came down, knowing what God had planned, he came down and he interfered and, and tempted us. And that's why, of course, we despise him. We should and despise his ways. But some things to think about. It seems that these angels were probably created there at the beginning and then watched the creation unfold. We don't know for sure, though. But uh, I don't want to leave anything out. Any, any thoughts on that? Any uh, passages or maybe uh, something I'm, I'm looking over there that would help us with that particular thought? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are you talking about between the days of creation? Okay, okay. Yes, yes. And, and let me say this, not that you're suggesting this, but just, just to, to, for clarity purposes. When you think about those days of creation, uh, the fact is God's time is not our time. It, it's not. And so when you, know, when you think of eternity, uh, a day is nothing to God. And for, is it First Peter where he says that a, you know, a, day's a, a thousand years is just a day to God? But when you look at those days of creation... You notice at the end of them, every time he says that the evening and the morning were the, the first day. And so in that particular case, in those particular six days, uh, we know that those were literal. Those were literal days in that case. Uh, and of course, uh, Exodus 20 and verse 11 maybe is uh, the best passage of all for that. For in six days, God hath, uh, had made the heaven and earth. So we, we assume that and of course take that to be, uh, to be literal there uh, as God would uh, speak that in, in the way that we would understand it. But that doesn't negate the fact, of course, that in God's eyes, a thousand years is, is like a day to Him. But, of course, He's telling us that, that these were literal days. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's a very fair, very fair conclusion. And it's very possible that he did create them before day one. The only reason, I guess the, the main reason I wouldn't just come out and say he did that is because there's no biblical evidence of anything that was created before day one. Um, nonetheless, Exodus 20 verse 11 doesn't necessarily prove that it was, that the spiritual beings in heaven itself, in God's heaven, uh, were created in those six days. I, I agree with you. Because that heaven is, is referencing that firmament in the sky. And, and all that uh, is therein, the stars, the moon, etc., and the sun. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Exactly, and I can't help but think about your profession too, as you say that, and, and what you know what that means. And you're exactly right. You, you know, you think about the evidence, you go with the best evidence, and that's what we have. Uh, you know, and some uh, some might argue there. You know, that uh, you go back to Genesis one, and, and the same argument uh, could be used that uh, you know it doesn't mention that God created the angels on day two or three, but it also doesn't mention that the angels were there in the beginning with the Godhead either. So you know, it goes it goes both ways, and so. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think all those are fair points to consider. The best evidence we have is that they were created sometime at the very beginning of creation and then watched the creation unfold and, and God's plan unfold. All right, let's keep going. Psalm 8, the 8th Psalm now, if you'll turn there with me. Psalm 8, verse 4. <clears throat> Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? We know this passage, right? And, and the son of man that thou visitest him. 
For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now once we get to the New Testament, if we didn't know it already, who is he referencing there? Who's going to be made a little lower than the angels? Now, in general, it's, it's kind of a, almost a dual meaning. In general, we are, as, as human beings, we're made lower than the angels. But prophetically speaking, who was going to be made, who, who chose to be lower than angels, Hebrews 2 and verse 9, that was Jesus the Christ. He was made a little lower than the angels. So there is a, uh, at least something else we can learn about this. When they were created and we were created, there was a difference in hierarchy. They are higher than us. We are lower than them. To what extent do you think that is true? In what sense... Are we lower than angels and they are higher than us? Is it because they're in heaven and that's depicted as up? What, what, in what sense would angels be higher than us? And in that same sense that Jesus made himself lower than them. Sorry? Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, they're spiritual beings. They're spiritual beings. Right? True or false, we long for a greater body to be a part of in eternity. It's, it's greater. It's a greater body. So being a spirit is far better than being in the flesh. So just in that alone, they would be higher than, than we are. But we also know that they have some abilities, um, things that to God, power has granted, He's granted them. And, so, and we'll see more of that in a moment. But uh, Christ was made a little lower than the angels. How many angels are there total? Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many angels were there? It makes me scratch my head too, brother. I hear you. How many angels were there in, in total? Another trick question, right? Does the Bible say that we can even number them? No. In fact, Hebrews 12, 22, an innumerable company of angels, described like the stars. Uh, just, just incredible. And again, I, I think we mentioned last week, how many angels are going to be coming with Jesus on the day of judgment, when He comes again, the second coming? All of them. Every one of them is going to be coming with Christ in the air. Can you imagine the, uh, every star in the sky, every star in the universe that we can't even see, turn them into angels, right? I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just trying to help us to fathom this, that every, just an innumerable amount of angels are going to be there. How awesome to think about. Psalm 68 and verse 17 mentions that uh, there will be thousands and thousands of angels. But look at Revelation 5. I want to, uh, to turn to this one. Perhaps the largest, closest thing to a number described for us of angels. No, uh, Revelation 5, verse 11. If somebody please would read that one for us when you get there. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of thousands. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands is almost just like an exponential increase uh, of, of this number. There are a lot of angels. You think it took God some hard work to create that many angels? You think that was hard on Him to do? That's the God we serve. With the voice of His mouth, with the breath that came out, He can create that. That is absolutely awesome. That's the God we serve or we should be serving every day. Matthew 26, 53 it's interesting, and I guess there's a number of reasons, but, but Christ chose a number when He was talking about how many angels He could call to come and help Him. Right? Or he described it in numbers form, and, and it was the, one of the numbers of God, and that was the number 12. He said, I can bring 12 legions of angels. He could have called 12 legions. How much or how many people uh, do they speculate were in the Roman legion? How many soldiers were in one legion of soldiers? About 6,000. About 6,000. So 12 legions, some quick math, that's how many angels? 72,000. So that's just one, and that's not all of them, probably not even uh, you know, 1%, I don't know. But 72,000, Jesus says, I could call. And how many did one angel kill of the Assyrians? But how many men, do you remember? I don't remember the exact number either for what it's worth. It was a lot, though. It was, it was a lot. I was hoping somebody would bail me out there and tell me, tell me what it was, but it was a lot. Several thousand, several, several thousand men died. I want to say it was 140-something thousand, something like that, that one angel took away. He was going to call 72. Just the absolute power of God, and they were all subject to Him. Not only that... Are you scratching again? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a good question. There's no evidence that outside of that moment when he created all those angels that any more being created, we know that they don't reproduce. Do, how do we know that, by the way? Which we haven't got to this point yet, but we know angels don't uh, procreate because they, they don't have physical bodies. They don't have physical bodies. Secondly, uh, angels are both male and female. They're spirits. There's, there's no gender. It's, it's, if we were to say one, it would be male, but there's, there's no gender. They're not, uh, they're not female. Uh, so they are, uh, it's, uh, there's not, they're not given in marriage either, by the way, of course, uh, as well. So, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, exactly. They, they seem, uh, they appear masculine. In fact, and as they appear on earth, which we're about to see, they always came in the form of which gender? Male. It was always man. It was always man. Uh, Jude, Jude 9 there, if you'd like to turn there with me. Jude 9, and maybe, maybe someone else go to Daniel 10 and verse 13 to save us a little time, and, and in just a moment I'll ask you to read. Somebody go to J Daniel 10 verse 13, and the rest of us, let's go to Jude 9. Of these thousands upon thousands upon thousands, we also know that there were angels that were called archangels almost as though they were higher even than the other angels, if there were a ranking system. Uh, they would be second in power and authority only to God Himself. Uh, because, in verse 9, yet Michael, this is Jude 9, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. We know Michael, one of the two, outside of Satan, uh, one of the two angels that are named, that are good angels, I guess, that are named, that's Michael and Gabriel. Michael was an archangel. Somebody that, that maybe turn to Daniel 10 and verse 13. Read that, please. Excellent. Later, in, in, in a few weeks, Lord willing, as we get deeper into this, we're going to talk about angels and, and nations. Very interesting how God had angels almost to protect, to oversee nations. Uh, we'll get into that. But for now, you notice there in the discussion about these princes, as Daniel's calling them, they're angels. He says, Michael, one of the chief, and what's the next word? Do you remember what she just read? One of the chief princes, plural, plural. In other words, what's the inference? Michael is one of the archangels, one of the chief archangels, but he is not the only one, is he? We don't know how many there are, but there are more than one. There is more than one archangel. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's, there's some truth to that, isn't there? These, these terrorists acting like, acting like these demons, aren't they? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Beautiful passage. And that is, that's the other angel that is named for us, Gabriel. But Gabriel's never described as an archangel, interesting enough. You know, some might speculate that the named angels were archangels, but that's not the case. It's, it, you know, we can assume they all have names. No reason not to. But uh, Gabriel, uh, excuse me, Michael, rather, was the archangel, but he was only one. The only other potential archangel we know of was who? Or is who? Satan. Satan. 
uh, I don't know who said it, but you're exactly right. In fact, I think I put the passage. Yeah, turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. And I'll show you where we get this idea. And of course, you know, you think about hell and that description. Jesus says that we'll go to that place, that place, hell, that's reserved for the devil and his angels. Right? Now notice that that word his there seems to be that of, a, uh, of ownership. Right? Uh, look at Revelation 12, 7. Maybe we'll see it better here. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels. Now why would it say Michael's angels? Because Michael is a what? An archangel. In some sense, he was over those angels. He had some authority and power over them. We don't know all the details. But in the same sense, there was someone else that was equal to Michael. And that is that he fought against this dragon. And by the way, uh, the dragon is described for us in verse 9 as the devil. No need to speculate. That's who the dragon was. He fought against the dragon and the dragon's what? He is angel. So Satan is depicted as having a company of angels just as Michael is. And in fact, again, devil and his angels are going to be there in hell and they're reserved there forever. So Satan, and it also brings light to the fact that these angels followed him, right? I don't know that everybody in his company, his band of angels, I don't know how it worked. I don't know if all the angels followed him as an archangel. I know they had the freedom to choose. But whoever did follow him, I knew that much, was going to be there with him in eternity in hell. He was the father, though, and so there's, there's no need to speculate as to who sinned first. It was him. He started it, and these other angels followed suit. Any other thoughts on that before we move on to the final portion tonight? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Oh, no, yeah, this, this has already happened here in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is, uh, is an interesting. There's four attacks if you read through Revelation 12. There's four attacks. There's an attack on the, the woman, uh, the child, the, the seed, and, and uh, the dragon uh, himself is attacking Michael in, in heaven. And uh, there's a, really there's a huge time period span there. If you, if you, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a deep study, I guess, uh, for another time. But uh, it has already happened. It has already happened there that uh, that took place. Uh, whether you, uh, you know, perceive that to be a literal battle or not, it's already taken place uh, in Revelation 12. Good question. Any, anything else? Yes, ma'am. You know, I've, I've thought about that, and I've, I've heard some say that they believe that was the first lie, that Satan, uh, the sin that caused him to, to, be, to have to leave heaven was pride, and then he came down and then told that first lie. I, I've heard that. I don't know. That's a good, good thought, though. It's a possibility. I don't think that there would be any reason to say that that couldn't be a possibility, that, that pride led him, but he was the first one to lie. Whether it was in the garden or before then, he did it. That's a great uh, observation and thought. For sure. I wish I there's gonna be so many questions I just don't know the answer to. It's a good one, yes sir. No, he is not. Yeah. They, well, Lucifer is actually not an angel at all. And that's that's another study, but you go to Isaiah 14, 12 and following and just maybe make note of it. Lucifer is actually the king of Babylon. He actually says, he'll tell you there in about verse 12 or so that it is the king of Babylon, and he'll go to go on to describe kind of what that uh, king does, but uh, that's, a, that's a common question, and it's no wonder that, that we become confused about Lucifer and the anointed cherub and those kinds of things, and uh, uh, the uh, Apollyon in Revelation and these beasts, because there's so many out there that are trying to say that, that that's Satan, or that's the, the, the Antichrist, or you know all of these different ideas that are foreign to the scriptures. Great question, though. Uh, another great question. Um, what do I do? Get back here. Here we go. All right, let's talk about, unless there's something else, let's talk about uh, the appearance of, of angels uh, with the, the remainder of our time. What do angels look like? Now, it, just last night, I, this happened that one of the ladies and I were talking about this. It's interesting because normally when you see an angel drawn, what, what does the angel look like? First of all, is, is the gender usually male or female? Most of the time. Usually female, which is interesting because there's no evidence ever of a female angel. Not only that, what do you also see wings? You always see wings. So you've got this beautiful female with, uh, you know, depicted as a beautiful female with long hair and, and two white wings. It usually is the, is the depiction. And again, it's, it's very interesting. I don't know where people come up with this stuff. Uh, there, are, there is some evidence for wings on angels, but that's it. That's about the only part of that that would be accurate. Uh, sometimes it shows them glowing or shining. There's some accuracy there maybe, but uh, it's very interesting. 
Uh, they're portrayed as humans with wings, but uh, the Bible doesn't really necessarily tell us exactly what they look like. But there are some interesting passages about what these angels look like, and, and I want to visit some of them. Yes, ma'am? Exactly. They can take the form of... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny you mention that because, you know, Hebrews 13, 2, it talks, and, and I feel like he's probably referencing back to Abraham, but it says, you know, you, you never know, you might just be entertaining angels unawares because they uh, can, in fact, take on the form. And, and you could argue that, I'm not saying that we do that still today, but, you know, you could, you could debate whether it is an eye, it was kind of like the speaking in tongues thing, whether it's a hearing miracle or an eye miracle, whether you're being able to see them as a physical person or whether they're actually changing into a physical person. But regardless, they take the form of, of men. In fact, let's look at a few verses. Uh, that leads us right into the, the passages we have, I believe. Daniel, let's go back to Daniel. Daniel has a lot to say about angels, and, and you'll notice we'll be visiting Daniel a lot. Daniel chapter 8, verse 15. There's a key word here that will remind us that this is not what the angels normally look like in their spiritual form, but they are changing form. And so what we're seeing here is not what they literally look like as a spirit, but the way that they presented themselves. Daniel 8, 15. It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So there's Gabriel again, this angel that is there. He's appearing to be a man. There's also someone else. And that someone else tells Gabriel, someone who's over Gabriel, maybe Michael, as that certainly would be logical in the context, could be God, but nonetheless, that tells him to help Daniel understand this vision, help him understand the meaning. And so what I want you to see here is that this angel appeared as a what? He appeared to be a man. He was not a man, he was an angel, which is a different form. But he appeared, he looked like a man. Hebrews 13, 2, we just mentioned it. They were so good at looking like a man that you would not be able to tell the difference. Abraham, you remember when they, these, uh, what was it, two men that came up and Abraham was good to them, he was hospitable, he, he had Sarah fix them some, some me, a meal, so, uh, got him something to drink and, and, and offered them a place to stay and come to find out these two men, he had no idea but these two men were what? They were angels. He entertained them unawares. But look at 2 Kings. I, I think this is so interesting and maybe, maybe something that uh, it's been a while since you've come across. 2 Kings 6 There were times that angels made themselves more, more commonly angels made themselves physical in appearance. They had the, I don't know, you know, God gave him that ability. I don't know if he did that just himself, and, and that was the way he worked in the Old Testament. I don't know if that's something they can do at will. I, I don't know. But they did it. However, there are a few occasions where the opposite happened. That is, instead of the angels changing form, they allowed man to see the spiritual realm for just a moment, to see spiritual things. And what an incredible experience that would have been. If you look at 2 Kings 6, 17, here's an example. When this is Elisha who is uh, surrounded, he's in the city, he's surrounded, and you remember his servant is upset, he's uh, concerned for their lives. Look at verse 15. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, that is Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? We're surrounded. Right? How are we going to survive this? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. In other words, God is on my side. What a great lesson. But notice verse 7. Excuse me, verse, that's a mystery. Verse 17. It says 7 in my Bible. Anyway. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. I, it's interesting because Elisha did not see this unless God you know, miraculously was allowing him to. He just trusted. He just had faith. But this servant was allowed to see something. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and here's what he witnessed. Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. 
Now that is incredible to me because at first glance, you realize Elisha's seeing all these horses and chariots. That's the physical Syrian army. But what the servant sees is something spiritual. When he opened his eyes, when God opened his eyes, he was allowed to see chariots of fire and horsemen all around. Who do you think that was? Who was he seeing? It wasn't man. It was probably angels. And then that brings up the new question. Can angels pose as chariots? You know, are, are angels on fire? There's, there's actually some evidence that, that they're associated with fire. We'll see in a moment. But a lot of questions arise. I don't know. But I do know that this was an interesting miracle because they didn't appear physically. They were all there. And man didn't realize it. Man had faith. Elisha did. But this servant got to see it with his own eyes. How awesome. It, this reminds me, and it's interesting again that it's Elisha because Elisha, this is the second time as he himself had already witnessed this before. You remember when? When did Elisha witness a flaming chariot? Spiritually speaking, he got to see it traveling up into heaven. Do you remember? Elijah. You remember Elijah was taking up in a whirlwind, but part of that was there was a flaming chariot. You go back to 2 Kings 2 and about verse 11, I believe it is. Uh, and you read that Elijah was taken up in a flaming chariot. So these angels, you see them in the form of a man, but spiritually, they're in this form of a chariot. I'm not saying that angels look like chariots, but they appeared that way in this day. They, they took them in, in the form of the army that was around them. They, they said, I've got this same thing. I, I can be chariots too, but I'm going to be able to defeat them because of God's power. No way. Luke, uh, Luke 24, 4. Miss King Rhodes and I have a plan that we're going we're gonna to find that bell and destroy it. <laughs> Luke 24, 4. Uh, you also see these two men here, and their countenance was like what? Remember? It was shining, and the countenance was like, like lightning. Now, Luke 24, 4, I don't believe, is where it says lightning, but at the resurrection they, they did. But you see this, this idea of fire or lightning in a countenance, a shining round about them. So one of the things to note about their appearance is oftentimes they would appear just as a regular man, but sometimes they wouldn't completely hide it. They would shine. They would glow. Do you remember when Moses, who was another man, who got a moment to see spiritual things, to speak with God in a special way, to see his backside? And when he would come down that mountain, what did the Bible say about his face? Shining. Connection. It, it was glowing. It was glowing. In fact, the people feared him. He had to wear a veil. They didn't know what to think of that. And so there's a connection there with, with seeing the spiritual and, and that, uh, that glow. And so these angels from the spiritual realm glow. Let me confuse you before we dismiss it. I've never said that before, have I? Look at Ezekiel for a moment. And, and I'm just joking about uh, confusing you, but I'll tell you what. This is one of the most explicit descriptions of what angels look like. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. I'm allergic to, uh, to something here. Ezekiel 1, beginning in verse 5. Very quickly. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Okay, they're not men, they're angels, but they had the, the appearance or likeness of them. Everyone had... Now think about this next time you're picturing an angel. Every one of them had four faces. Four faces and everyone had four wings. Their feet were straight feet and their sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. This is the most detailed description I can find of these angels. They had the hands of a man, and this is a vision now. Do they actually look like this? I don't know. But they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they had their four faces and their four wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they want, and they went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they had, excuse me, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. You got an eagle, lion, uh, ox, thank you, and a man, and their four faces. What a creature. Kind of reminds you of the uh, chimera from, from mythology. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings, every one was joined one to another. Two covered their bodies. They went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not from where they went. Verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. It's very consistent throughout the description of angels. It's fire, it's usually associated with lightning, not a fire in the sense that we would think of, but 
fire as of lightning, like the appearance of, of lamps, he said. So it's that bright white light almost, um, or somewhat fire, of course, if you think of their lamps. Either way, it went up and down from the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth light. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of light. Now as behold the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. So here's another wheel I can share with you. Very, very interesting. I can't, you know, try to make sense of that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Probably not. It, probably not. This is probably uh, you know a poetic, figurative type of uh, description. Uh, but it's interesting. Some of the, the things that are mentioned that are connected. Um, the wings. The wings change a lot too. And the um, the two described. And I'm about to run out of time. But the two described. And this is where we're going to have to pick up next time, Lord willing. And uh, we'll go into more detail. But you know the names: the, the cherubim and the seraphim. Now keep in mind, to be fair, these two are never called angels. They're never called angels. However, it seems logical to conclude that they are angels because they're not God and they're not man. And the only other beings we know of besides the two are angels. So these, uh, these cherubims and seraphims uh, give us some more information as to their appearance, the details, and, and quite possibly the most accurate description as to what they probably really do look like. Uh, we'll, we'll check out next time. Our, our time. Thank you so much for your attention. Hang around for a few moments. Yes, ma'am. Interesting. Baby angels. Well, there was, those cherubims guarded the tree of life, and I have a feeling they weren't babies. I don't know, but almost like Cupid or something, right? He was. He was. He was. And it's good to remember that, isn't it? Uh, stick around. We'll have a uh, song, an invitation, a few announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you for